rainy skies start the season at Nationals Park, we're tracking wet weather hour by hour before the team takes the field. Plus, a preview of everything you need to know this year. I'm really ready to see these boys play. The Nash is going knocking on the park. The newest foods and best deals of the upcoming season. FAFSA forcing college students into crunch time. Why schools are considering pushing back their May 1st decision deadline. And get ready, get set, roll. The sights and sounds from this year's White House Easter Egg Roll. You're watching the station covering all of the DMV. This is DC News Now. Well, good morning and happy opening day. We are starting off the week with a live look at Nats Park. The Nationals will play the home opener against the Pirates later today, but you can see the tarp is on the field because it has been raining this morning. We'll have more on that coming up, but good morning. Thanks for starting your Monday with us. I'm Tanaya Wright. And I'm Shanika Grimshaw filling in for Corey James on this very soggy morning. Yamari, she's going to be busy because of the rain, so she'll be tracking your commute. And Jackie is out at Nats Park, and she's with all the food and fun and some of the rain, uh, Jackie. So what can people expect? Yeah, well, I mean, we did see a downpour move through earlier this morning, so that's why the tarp is drenched. But right now, we're not seeing any rain showers within the radius of Nats Park. I would say the closest thunderstorm that we're seeing right now is about 20 miles to the north, closer towards Olney and across parts of Montgomery County at this point. That's really the leading edge of any of those showers and downpours that we're seeing right now. But again, like I mentioned, here at Nats Park, we're tracking the dry conditions, so let's get right to the forecast, shall we? I mean, we're talking about temperatures right now. Those are into the lower 50s. Here here at DC or at, the, at least at Nats Park. We're seeing those temperatures into those lower 50s. We'll eventually notice those temperatures warming back up into those lower 60s later on today, right around first pitch. That's really when we'll see those temperatures uh, warming up just a, a little bit. But you notice by first pitch, you see those cloudy skies. So again, through the morning hours, we'll be seeing those hit and miss rain and thunderstorms across the region, and we'll continue to monitor uh, that radar all throughout the rest of the morning too. By the end of the game, temperatures falling back into those upper 50s, but I'll have more on the forecast and that general forecast across the region coming up in my full weather hit. But right now, I do want to toss it back into the studio to Yamari Marie with the very latest on those roadways. How's it looking out there this morning? Hey, good morning. So right now we are monitoring a crash that's happening in the Hagerstown area off of I-270. As you can see, traffic is slowing down. It's starting to pick back up compared to a couple of minutes ago. We're going to maneuver over to the map so we can just take a look at that congestion at this moment. As you can see, things are moving a lot faster right now, but still just that area is a big concern. So we're going to continue to monitor that for you. Back to you guys. <laughs> Well, to Nats Park we go once again. The Nationals will be playing their home opener later this afternoon. Oh, yeah, a lot of fun. Fans can expect to see some new changes today all season long as well. We have DC News Now's Tosin Fakile. She's out there smiling. She's having fun. <laughs> How does it feel to be out there, Tosin? <laughs> feels like being home, Shanika and Tanaya. It feels like being home. It feels good to be at Nats Park for the home opener this morning and hopefully ready for a winning season and hopefully a winning game today when the Nats take on the Pirates. And fans are excited, not just for this, but their players as well. We're talking uh, CJ Abrams. We're talking Josiah Gray. We're talking Lane Thompson, all of the players. And this season, fans can not just expect great things on the field, great things off the field as well. Speaking of the field, let's take a look at it. Soak it all in before it gets packed with thousands of fans today and fans can expect some new things this season. There's the interactive scoreboard that you're looking at right there. Fans, it lets fans know their favorite players, how they're doing, plus more stats on their favorite players. There are also new screens set up around the stadium, including behind home plates. So there are also new LED field lights as well to brighten up the park. We're Getting into the park is also a lot smoother thanks to a partnership between the Nats and MLB. Fans can simply walk through the clear lane at the center field entrance using the MLB ballpark app. And also new this season for home games, the Nats will take the field earlier and the time will be moved up from 7.05 to 6.45. We did that because we want to make sure that our fans can see all nine innings on a weeknight. Uh, we, it's, even if it's a school night or a work night, I know my kids are very excited about being able to come on, uh, on school nights now. 
And you know the Nats never disappoint when it comes to food options, so fans can also expect new food options this season as well. And of course, the Nats are hosting the Pirates this evening. The first pitch is at 4.05. So already spoke to Executive Vice President. He tells me all of the exciting things that fans can expect. There are new ways and more affordable ways for you to watch the Nats play this season. We talked to uh, the Director of Field Operation. The field is ready, as you can see that tar protecting parts of the field. The other thing that we're going to talk about coming up in the six o'clock hour is food. I'm telling you, the Nats never disappoint when it comes to food. So what new foods can you expect when you come watch your favorite team play? Well, we'll have those answers for you coming up in the next half hour. But for now, we are live at Nats Park. Tanaya Shanika, play ball. We'll be Tosin. back at about hey, 635. I got the ball we're right ready. here. We're ready, Tosin. And we're really ready for the food. I cannot <laughs> oh, wait yes. to see. All We're ready food. for her to bring back some food. So, I know. Tosin, please, I need you to promise us that you're going to bring us some food. I'll, I'll try my best. I will try <laughs> my best. I will try my best. Because you know, if I don't I, eat it all first. I would say, you know, all I have here is a bag oh, of the, Cheerios. So, yeah, we need some crackers. real food. <laughs> so we're struggling. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Tosin. I got you guys. I got you guys. All right, 605 in Montgomery County. Health officials say the coyote responsible for last week's attack tested positive for rabies. They're now advising residents to check in with their doctor if they've made contact with the animal. Both happened six hours apart in Burtonsville on Thursday. In the first incident, the coyote attacked a woman near Watershed Park and she was taken to the hospital. In the second attack, a woman reportedly fought the animal off and stabbed it. The coyote was eventually shot and killed nearby a trail. Your time right now is 6.05 this morning. D.C. police are investigating a deadly shooting that happened in Navy Yard. Police say Michael Quander Jr. was shot inside of an apartment on second place early Sunday morning. When police arrived at the scene, they say they found him dead with several gunshot wounds. No arrests have been made. Police say anyone with any information is asked to give them a call. In a fire displaced five people and two cats in southeast. Officials say this happened on 30th Street yesterday morning. They say a candle sparked that fire. As of right now, there is no word on any injuries. And continuing our coverage of Baltimore's bridge collapse, officials say they're now preparing to create a temporary alternate channel for essential boats to use the waterway. Crews are also working to stabilize the site so divers can search for four missing workers who are all presumed dead. Over the weekend, teams of engineers began to remove the first section of twisted steel from the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. Officials also say pressure on an underwater natural gas pipeline has eased, but they're asking the public to report any debris they might see. I've sailed underneath that bridge a hundred times, and I've, you know, that's the gateway to wherever you want to go. It was very sad, you know. Um, he stayed on the bow for about maybe 10 minutes, so weeping. And Maryland Governor Wes Moore is set to be briefed on the bridge recovery efforts today. That's at 3 p.m. He's holding a press conference in Baltimore to update the public on its progress and will have continuing coverage on the recovery efforts underway at the Port of Baltimore, both on air and online. And church services across Baltimore yesterday honored the lives lost in the bridge collapse. Reverend Aiko Walker at Sacred Heart of Jesus urged better treatment of migrant workers. That includes the six construction workers filling potholes on the bridge who are presumed dead after the collapse. Of the total eight construction workers on the bridge, two survived. Yes, we can rebuild the bridge, but we also have to look at the way in which migrant workers are treated and how best we can improve their situation as they come to the United States of America to make the United States of America a better place. He says the bridge should be a symbol for coming together as a community through mercy and hope, even in the most difficult situations. And people in the district recognizing the Transgender Day of Visibility. The holiday on Sunday celebrates the lives and contributions of transgender people while also highlighting the issues the community faces. The event was presented at the National Center for Transgender Equ Equality and Queer Equity Institute. And this all happened at the National Mall. It included trans activist speakers from across the country, including Minnesota Representative Lee Fink, the first transgender lawmaker elected to the state's legislature. The reason we're here today is because of the importance of what the National Trans Day of Visibility means. Right here, we are doing transform the boat so we can make sure that we're visible 
not just in the community, but also in the ballot box, so we can show the country that we are a voting block. Officials also provided community resources to help people get registered to vote. All right, your time is about 6.10 this morning. The Princess of Wales sharing new details about her battle with cancer.